everyone to uh, the Art Discovery Series on the facts and facets of jewelry making. It's going to be a fun conversation. And um, as with all of our topics, we have, gosh, any number of amazing um, jewelry artisans who could have joined us. But um, we really have found that the format is great with uh, three, can, uh, three people joining on the panel. So uh, today we have selected a wonderful representation uh, with Shel Shelley Call and Paul Farmer and Diana Ferguson. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about each of them in a minute. But just to get started, if you're on Zoom with us, um, if you're not familiar with Zoom, up in the upper right hand corner, you'll have the choice of the gallery view or the speaker view. And we're going to suggest that you put your screen in speaker view is that will um, highlight um, more prominently when one of the uh, panelists is speaking. You should be able to see them full screen and, and the rest of the, the participants in little tiles. And um, it's, it's absolutely very best if you have yourself on mute unless you're speaking. And it's up to you if you want your video on or off. We, we are happy to see you. It, it makes us feel connected. But um, if you don't want it on, we understand that as well. Um, there's also on the lower bar of, of your Zoom screen um, or on Facebook, we welcome questions. The, the Zoom screen, you want to go down to the bottom, there's a little chat box and you can open that up and type in a question or a comment if you have one, or you can um, unmute yourself and, and say, hey, I have a question. We, we welcome that as well. And on Facebook, if you've got any questions, just um, type them right down there in the comments and we will do our best to answer those as we go through today's discovery series. And uh, I do have one question that we'll get to later. And Beth, I shared it with you to help me remember um, that came from somebody earlier today that emailed me in advance. So if you're joining us in the future, um, you can also submit questions in advance so that we make sure we try to cover everything that you're interested in. So. Um, again, so welcome to Friday. Can you believe it's September 25th? It's been the longest year and the fastest year all at the same time. I don't really know how that's working, but um, we're happy that we've stayed connected with each of you on Zoom and Facebook. And today's topic is really fun. It's one of my favorite things, which is uh, jewelry. Everybody who knows me knows I have a little bit of a weakness for it. And today I was like, okay, how am I going to represent all three of these magnificent jewelers today? So I have, I'm sporting one of my favorite Diana Ferguson pieces, which is a gorgeous uh, beaded bracelet hand woven. She can tell you about it. It's one of my favorite things as a magnetic closure, which is super cool. And I have my Shelly Paul uh, London Blue Topaz ring. And I'm sporting uh, from Paul Farmer, my Sleeping Beauty turquoise, which just gives you an indication of how, what a good eye he has for collecting uh, unique and uh, rare stones because Sleeping Beauty Turquoise is almost extinct. So maybe we can share a little bit more about that as we go. But um, so joining us today from Big Bear Lake is Shelly Call in California, up in the mountains. Hey, Shelly. And then from Colorado, we have Paul Farmer in the Vail Valley area up there in beautiful Colorado. He shared uh, some Great pictures of some mule deer momentarily ago. And then right right near me here in uh, the Phoenix metro area by Scottsdale is Diana Ferguson. Hi, everyone. Uh, hey, so we're happy to be here. So as, as we always do, I'm going to ask each of them to kind of shed a little bit of light for us on um, of all the art forms and ways to express their creativity. Uh, I'd love for them to share, you know, why they selected jewelry and maybe how long they've been doing what they've been doing. And I think we'll go ahead and start with you, Shelly, since uh, okay. that goes so, I Jewelry I've been making for close to 20 years, but the silversmithing were probably about 17. And I basically got into it because I, I like jewelry myself. And I like to wear rings. I really have a, a I guess a ring fetish. So I wanted to be able to make myself some rings. So it started purely innocently as a hobby and I took some classes and I got addicted and I really loved working with the metal and the stones and the fire and it just stayed with me. <laughs> fire. Right. 
Beautiful. Okay. Well, we, we're going to come back and I think uh, you hit on some of the key tools that will go along with jewelry making. And, and so I think we'll circle back to that um, with the equipment that you need to, to create these beautiful works. But um, Diana, how about you? How long have you been in jewelry and why did that pique your interest? Um, well, I had a background in art history and um, studio art from college, but I went into um, the professional world and spent about 20 plus years in the corporate marketing and so forth. And um, I, eventually I just wanted to begin to explore that creative side of myself again. And jewelry um, is actually a um, very accessible way to get back into art. And so one thing kind of led to another, and I guess it's been about 12 years now um, that I've been doing full-time work as a jeweler. So um, I just find it is, uh, allows me to really explore a lot of my artistic vision. And you do explore. I've loved watching you yeah. through different, <laughs> different lines and um, I, I see that excitement in your eye when you come and say, oh, I have a whole new line of things. And, um, yeah. and each one of you, the way you combine composition and color and ge geometry and, you know, it's so fascinating, but uh, we'll have you share some of your techniques and reasons why you have to keep kind of exploring new things. So, thanks, Diana. And okay, Paul, how about you? How long have you been a jeweler and why, why jewelry? Oh, well, I think I stopped counting at about 25 years. I don't know how <laughs> Fair many, enough. I don't really keep track, but um, uh, my mom was an artist or is an artist and my dad is a musician. They're both still alive, both doing art and playing music. And uh, then I married someone who was, her mother was a goldsmith and we took some classes together and it kind of went from there and uh, I love colored stones. So I took a lot of colored stone classes and really started collecting unique, unique stones that are really special. And they're just uh, like the Sleeping Beauty turquoise is something that the mine is closed. So there's no more of it. And the closest thing is Persian turquoise. But um, there's a lot of very unique stones and I combine the, my love of the colored stones with the jewelry making and um, kind of go from there. Okay, that's great. And uh, I think we'll stick with you and, and work our way backwards. Um, you, ha you are very well known for a specific type of uh, goldsmithing called um, granulation. And there's really not that many people that do that. So you're combining the skill of, of the goldsmithing and then you always find just the most perfect stone to complement it. And that's like a little bit of a hunt. And I know usually during uh, the time that the gem show is going on in Tucson, throughout that week, there's usually uh, at least two jewelers gone each day trekking down to find perfect stones. But so Paul, if you can share a little bit about the art of the granulation and how that's been such a signature for you. And then some of your other settings that maybe, you know, really stand out and how you find just the right stone. Okay, so um, granulation is, are, can you hear me? Yep. Again, okay, so granulation is, uh, I create little tiny spheres of gold from wire. So I start with wire, it's actually, thinner than this right here. And I cut little snippets and then I melt those into little balls of gold. So they're called granules. And um, uh, I create different patterns onto the gold, which just accentuate the piece. And it's really about the stone, not so much as the granulation, but um, I just want to accentuate the, what the stone does. And so certain stones have patterns so sometimes I will um, uh, make patterns that mimic the stone, like in the, this is a, a very rare emerald called trapeche. And I used uh, uh, some little triangles that are in there. So there's little pyramids of triangles and things like that within the, within the piece. Um, I've done, oh, a clamshell replacement opal that's really cool. Um, did that years ago. And so it had some, very unusual things like little 
circles and pinwheels inside the opal. And so I did wire work and granulation that mimic those. So, um, but I find unique stones. Um, and like these right here are, uh, these are watermelon tourmaline. So the crystal, when it grows, um, they're not actually this big. It's this is, uh, enlarged. That would be a little heavy. But um, yeah, they would be very heavy. Uh, but you can see it's like red in the center and then green on the outside. And, and this is a cut for a slice from the tourmaline itself. So they have different colors in the stone. So I just find a lot of unique things. That's stunning. And uh, surrounding that <laughs> earring, is that granulation as well that you did oh, the outline? This is granulation. So all these are little granules of gold. And then up here I did wires and they're concentric circles. Um, so, I mean, it, it, I just play around with it. It just, I get my inspiration from the stone. Yes. And uh, do you have a, I mean, that, the emerald behind you is amazing. And I believe, oh. <laughs> is that the one that was featured in? Uh, it, it's in a book on Colombian emeralds. So um, uh, they, they're extremely rare. Uh, all the black lines form this natural star within the stone, but it's, it's not caused by light hitting it. And it's caused by carbon in the growth axis of the stone. So they're extremely rare. And uh, a couple fellows are writing a book on Colombian emeralds and they contacted me and because there's just not many of them out there. And so I'm in a book with uh, uh, the crown jewels of Spain and France and Cartier, Tiffany, Piaget. So, you know, it's pretty nice. nice. And then both of these are going to be featured along with two more pieces in a book coming out sometime either this fall or the spring. So do you have any, you know, favorite stones? Oh, I... I, I use tourmaline a lot. Um, another stone I love is called Sphene. It's oh, S-P-H-E-N-E. Yeah. -E, and it's a very incredible stone that just has a lot of play of color coming out of it. So um, uh, diamonds have dispersion and that's that play of color. So if you have a white diamond, you have red and blue and green coming out. Well, in Sphene, it does the same thing, except that it's like five times more of what a diamond has. So they're really incredible. They're natural. Um, one of my favorite stones and then trapeche emerald uh, and tourmaline, kind of my kind of my favorites. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. And this fiend, if if you've never seen one of his fiend, are you going to have one this in 2021? I'll have some. Yeah. I'll have some I mean, for sure. yeah. It really is just breathtaking and uh, I, I think a lot of art and, and also jewelry is almost made for just the right person. And when the, when the person comes in and sees it, they connect immediately. And I know, Shelly, you recently had a piece that you designed that before you could even, I mean, you got it photographed and before you could even send it to me for our publication, you had a client that said, I have to have that. Uh, yeah, I put it on my website. She sneaked on my website in the middle of the night and called me the next morning. So. Actually, it's this one, and the only reason she, uh, she doesn't have it and I do is because she's moving from one uh, condominium to the other, and she's having her safe moved, so I'm keeping some of her. So you're babysitting? Everything safe for her. Not wearing them out every night, but, and this, this is, I don't know what, how much you can see, but it's actually, um, this is a very large 5.6 carat tanzanite, which is one of my personal favorite stones, um, reticulated sterling silver. 14 karat gold fused around the edge. Uh, these are some orange sapphires in here. And then I made the bale large enough to go on, you know, a, a collar type piece. And the bale itself is made out of reticulated gold. And, and anyway, it just, I, you know, I do some, actually I do some very large kind of wild pieces. And then on the other end of the scale, you didn't ask, but on the other end of the scale, you know, I have something this size next to it. So something for everyone. So you said three things that I would love for you to expand on. And I think our, our listeners will too. You talked about uh, tanzanite and let, let's talk about the, the hardness and lack of hardness of tanzanite and, and how the best way to wear tanzanite is. You also talked about sapphires and how, and I'd love for you to share about how many different colors. 
I didn't know prior to really, you know, diving in how many stones come in such variations of color. So maybe talk about that. And then your signature uh, reticulated silver with the, with the gold overlay. Um, I would love for you to explain a little bit more about how that comes to be. Okay, so first we'll talk about tanzanite. Tanzanite is very soft on the Mohs scale that they use. Um, tanzanite is very low and it is best used in pendants because it does scratch very easily. Now you can wear a tanzanite ring, but it's best to have it, you know, surrounded by metal, buried in deep into the, uh, into the piece. Um, they do they do tend to wear over time if you're a very active person and you dig in your purse It's not the best stone for everyday wear, but a pendant gets much less Obviously it gets much much less wear and tear because people aren't you know Not going up to that Every day so it survives better as a pendant or earrings also So that was the Tanzanite question. Um, the second question was the number of colors that many stones come in. And for instance, uh, the sapphires come in almost every color under the sun, almost every color in the rainbow. And I work also a lot with um, topaz and quartz and those also come in quite an array of natural colors and very popular on the market now is enhancing natural stones to patented colors and, and and things like that where I I don't like working with stones that are not the natural stone but I will work with a stone that has an enhanced color as long as I know that that enhancement is going to stay with the stone for the life of it and for the wear, wear for my customer and the third thing you asked me about was reticulation so I just really love texture um, I plain shiny Sterling silver is absolutely beautiful, um, you know, just something like this, but the te texture, and this is not polished, so this is what silver looks like when it is not all polished up and, and finished like this, but taking it from here to here is about a 17-step process, and I don't know how vivid you can get it on the screen, but you can see it's all wrinkly. And basically that's it. The wrinkles never come out the same. And because it is, because it doesn't come out the same, it makes each of my pieces, it's each piece one of a kind in terms of the texture. And it just allows me to look into the piece and then I'll use this piece as basically a piece of paper. And I will actually draw on my paper with Sharpie. Here's a pendant, slide pendant in the making. And these actually are going to be tourmaline, <laughs> watermelon tourmaline, because I also love the tourmaline. And um, by the way, the Sharpie does come off. Okay, I was wondering. <laughs> you were worried, right? <laughs> so yeah, so I, I really have chosen to work with sheet metal versus um, casting, which requires pulling, pouring molten metal into a mold or something like that. I, I really love to bend, twist, turn wrinkle, melt, fuse to just really torture the metal. It's fun for me. And then how do you get the gold? So that I actually take a, a long rod of 14 karat gold and I, I actually hold the rod in one hand because gold doesn't conduct electricity or uh, heat. It doesn't conduct heat as quickly as even silver. And so I will have it in one hand and I'll have my little torch, which I actually have in the other hand, and I will fuse it right on to the outside of the sterling silver to give it a little, little gold frame. You can also uh, fuse silver to silver. And in recent days, I have been doing more. Here's a flashcard. Um, I have this is where I have fused silver to silver. And so I just started and I shaped the piece into a two inch wide cuff. And then I just took the same rod. I have to hold it more with, um, with tweezers because the silver gets a little hotter. It, it, it heats a little more quickly. And then, but again, same technique where I take the torch in one hand and I just fuse it in directions that I want it to go. And sometimes it goes exactly where I want it to go and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes that <laughs> makes the best art. 
<laughs> the joy of uh, creation, right? Well, that's great. Um, you draw on the silver paper, as you call it, but do you draw, do you sketch out your designs? I do. Before you start? I do as a form of communication with my customers, but my drawing skills far uh, lag behind my metal skills. I was trained, my, you know, I came into this business um, learning from another artist. Uh, I came into it um, from a business background, kind of like Diana, I went through the corporate world. I was, you know, um, had my own staffing agency and so a totally different realm. And so I did not learn uh, the t fancy drawing techniques. If you, if you go to art school or something and you can draw these really fancy designs that are some, sometimes even prettier than the works themselves, never with me. So and when I draw something to communicate with a customer what it is I'm going to be doing, in fact, never once have I have they ever said that the, the piece of jewelry was not more beautiful than my drawing. So I'm safe there. I, but I will draw just basic shapes and sizes and lengths and like, you know, here's a pair of earrings I was working on today for somebody, you know, she wanted the two inch length. And so I'll, I'll draw what I was going to do. And yesterday, this was just a little stick figure cross on a, on a piece of metal. And then I'll lay it next to a ruler. And that's just, it's a form of communication for me with my customers. But the most fun for me is just taking a sheet of metal And just working with it and that includes twisting turning folding using more metal to it like i don't know if you can see this one i haven't put the stone in it yet but this is i've actually taken wire and wrapped it up around it's like wire wrapping on top of a sterling silver band i don't know i just have fun and so i like i like metal, Sheet metal wire. i think some people sculptors and jewelers tend to think in 3d instead of 2d mm -hmm. so Oh, and here's a fun one. This one looks scary because it I don't know if you can see the little, can you see the, oh yeah, the, the pieces of wire sticking up from it. Those are not a scary um, thing. Those are actually gonna be posts for pearls. So this is gonna be okay. called, this is another one where I've fused layers and layers of silver to itself and it'll have that darker finish like in my flash card. And then in contrast, it's gonna have some pretty soft pretty pearls on it so that's somebody's holiday gift nice well thank you we'll be back for more from you later and um i i think it's a good time to say i know each one of these fabulous jewelers in addition to the pieces you create for the general public you each also do commission work so if anybody has something special that they want or need we can say need right Oh, jewelry. Yes. We need jewelry. Um, Hi, Lynn. <laughs> you know, they can they can certainly make something specifically for you. So let's turn it over to Diana. And um, you know, Diana, you are multifaceted. I you do your hand cut earrings yeah. that are made out of paper, you do your beadwork, you this is a your earrings that you have on today is kind of a newer line. I mean, you you're just your mind must just always be going. Yeah, I think one of the reasons that I um, love doing art is it's a great way for me to focus like all my interests that I have and my curiosity and it's just a terrific um, outlet. And so I really just allow myself over the years to explore and not be tied to one specific thing. So I, I'm probably most, you know, well known for my, my petals to the metal earrings with the watercolor paper and the anodized aluminum. And I still love making these, um, but I kind of uh, branched out to another um, total passion of mine, which is um, my uh, geometric beadwork and my black beadwork. So this is a new geometric pendant that I'm just finishing up. It's got like all this cool dimension and it's got all these textures and it, it's really quite cool. And um, then I'm working also with polymer, which is a um, synthetic clay. And uh, with the polymer, I'm basically working with um, what are called demirs. So this has been fun for me because I'm creating like little artworks on clay using pan pastels and acrylic and ink and texturing tools and 
then I use this to kind of cover a substrate or even just work with that piece of clay. So these are some new earrings that I just finished yesterday. Oh, and neat. They have some kind of Egyptian seance kind of look to them. And so whatever my mood is, I've got something that I'm working on that is, you know, right where I want to be. So, yeah. That is so great. Now your, your bead work that you do, those are all glass beads? Right, and they are, so this is a little collection like in my photo that I have. And what they are, they're glass uh, cylinder beads. They're made in Japan by a company um, called Mayuki, although there's different, um, a couple different manufacturers, but they're tiny. These are a size 11. There's also a size 15 that's even smaller. I don't know if I can, well, I won't, but they're very tiny, as you can probably see. And then uh, with, with that, it's just a fire line, which is like a, what you use to tie fishing lures, and um, little needles, size 10 beading needles. And I use peyote stitch, which is um, just an amazing, stitch with a very old tradition going back to probably Celtic times, but also Native American and just all across the world. So it's a universal sort of stitch. And there's a movement called contemporary geometric beadwork that is really encouraging. It's kind of an open source movement. Everyone is sharing their ideas and it's just creating these sort of volumetric forms with the beads. Now, does that stretch at all? This particular one, um, it kind of is uh, got enough give to it. It's not that it stretches, but it's got some play. It's malleable. So yeah, it's malleable, right. And then um, like working on uh, uh, some, some sort of flat pieces here also that have a little geometry to them too. So okay. like origami, yeah. So. Here's my piece I have to show off again. I mean, this, I just, I fell in love with this instantaneously because it's, it's like a tapestry. And I love doing the beautiful flat work like that. It's, um, it matches it's, your painting. It's, it, yes, it really does. Uh, Max Hammond's painting, by the way. Uh, but anyways, um, yeah, I love doing the flat work and I will be having um, quite a few uh, new bracelets for 2021. So I have a question for, I'm going to tie two questions together. One is um, my question. The other one is really what came from our, uh, our viewer earlier today. Do you draw out every one of your designs or how do you figure when to change the color of oh, the bead? Okay. And then I'll follow up with the other one later. Okay. So like this is a great example. So in this, this little veneer here, it's completely... Um, I would say that I am more of a, uh, I work by intuition or instinct. So I knew that the palette that I wanted here, and I just uh, laid down the color, and then I basically started to do the texturing and just let it go. And that's the way I tend to work. Like I don't ever really sketch things out or rare. Like I have a couple of ideas on my board right now where it's a quick sketch to remind me I want to do this, you know, certain idea, but nothing formal. Um, so it is a lot of, um, um, I have a, I have actually a mantra, which is process plus exploration plus technique plus serendipity equals my art. And those are the four things. So there's a lot of serendipity in what I do and it's joyful to me. Can you say those again? Process? It's process exploration, technique, and serendipity. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Sounds like a pretty good way to create. <laughs> it works. <laughs> and there's a so, lot of failures along the way. Like there's failures. Like I have bags full of, you know, it didn't quite work out perfectly, but a lot of successes too, so. Hey, if you're not failing, you're not trying. <laughs> So the question that came from Lynn earlier is, um, she's wondering if any of the artists dream in color 
and how their dreams may or may not impact their work. Wow. Um, I do dream in color. For myself, speaking for myself, I do dream in color. Um, I, I don't, I can't say that I get a dream that directly influenced my work personally, but um, I think the mood maybe sometimes might catch me and push me in a certain direction. And I, I, I have no doubt that you dream in color, seeing all the beautiful colors that you use. So. Can you imagine if I only dreamed in black and white? <laughs> the world would be less more beautiful, for sure. Um, Paul, how about you? Do you dream in color? Do you dream about those stones? Oh, I definitely dream about those stones, occasionally in color, but usually I get ideas, I'm like I'm perplexed about something and how I'm going to do a piece, and and then like early morning I'm dreaming and I can, I'm in that REM sleep and all of a sudden this idea comes to me and I'm like, oh my God, that's it. That's exactly what I want to do. So yeah, so there's some really cool things that coming out of, you know, just thinking about it and you're just sleeping on it overnight and they just pop into your head. It's amazing. Yeah. I know I solve a lot of problems at 4 a.m. right before I wake up. Yeah. So that's great. Um, now, Paul, are you able to, uh, yesterday we were talking and you could show us your, <clears throat> your uh, station yeah. a little bit. Gonna, yeah, and also I'll show you a drawing that I did for a client. So occasionally uh, someone wants me, you know, I'm doing a commission and they want a drawing of what they're, I'm not coloring it in or anything like that, but just a drawing of what it's gonna be like. So I'm going to flip to my rear camera. So this one, oops, I got to get the right direction. Okay, so I gave her two different choices because she talked about doing like a cigar band type of thing. And then she, she ended up going with this one. I'm trying to get it straight. There we go. So she ended up going with this. I don't have the piece here because she has it, um, but they're kind of similar to a few of these things that are here. So we were talking earlier about um, uh, color, different colors of sapphire. So that one's like a blue green sapphire. Mm. Okay. This one is uh, Pod Parasha sapphire, which is kind of like a peachy color on each end and then pink in the center. Ooh, pretty. Yummy. There's a ruby. And the ruby is actually the same thing. It's the same stone. The only difference is we call it ruby if it's red or pink red, but they're the same actual uh, stone. And then these are some of my, like I make tubing out of gold. And like there's the a trapeze emerald, if I can get it. I got to figure out how to do this. I'm going opposite. Oh. There we go. Okay. Uh, in here somewhere. I know it's right here. There Look it is. Oh, wow. There you go. Yeah. So there's a trapeze emerald that I'm working on right now for a client here in Vail. And this is going to be her 60th anniversary, I mean, 60th birthday gift. And she already bought the earring. So I had a great show. And then. You see right there, this is what I would start with. If we can get it in there. This is how I make the ring shank. And then I make the tubing. And I fuse all that on. So these are the tubes, that, like right here, these are tubes that I've made. And there's the gold sheet that I made. And these are all the little grangles, if I can get that in there, there we go. And, and you're using uh, 14 karat and 18 karat? No, this is 18 karat gold. Okay. Which is softer than 14 oh, karat. And I will show you, this is a sneak peek of a piece that I'm making. Wow. Okay, I've got to try to figure out how to get in here. There we go. Okay. This, uh, there we go. That is an abalone pearl, which is a natural pearl. And then on the top is a tourmaline, 
Uh, there's a Montana Sapphire, Blue Zircon, uh, there's going to be a Spinel, Tourmaline, some Diamonds, and then below the Tourmaline on the top is actually going to be a Swivel, and this is going to rotate. So you see on the back side, because the pearl goes all the way around, and it will um, actually spin so you can play with it. It's very cool. And then there, it's going to be a clasp on the top. And so there's going to be a, a necklace that I'm going to hand make for it as well. Wow. That's impressive. So By it's, the way, it's, Paul's it's, really good at keeping secrets because one year in, you know, March, I guess, Jake acquired a gorgeous set for me that I didn't see until August on my birthday. And I had no idea. I was completely shocked. So that's you true. Your secrets. <laughs> yeah. I'm surprised he kept it that long. <laughs> yeah, well, he's pretty good. He's, he's, he's good at that. He's a yeah, saver. Yeah, good. yeah. Um, I think we have a question from Facebook that Beth's going to share with us. Yes. Um, Janice wants to know: Does anyone use their jewelry in decorative art paintings? In in what? in De decorative art hangings oh the actual jewelry piece do you mean as a component of the larger um she doesn't specify but even um if you make any sort of also um do art for for the wall or anything oh, i do <laughs> can i talk about that or absolutely yeah, I i've been working on some cool um polymer wall hangings that um, are very neat. And then my big project, this is going to be huge, but I kind of showed you guys these guys before. These are all glass beads. It's called a high par or warp square. And I need to do about 15 of them. And it's going to be a very cool long wall hanging. Oh, fabulous. So, yeah. So that's some of the things that I'm pushing myself to do more art pieces as well as the jewelry so very cool and the way you have your uh necklace behind you displayed on the mannequin yeah. I, I i have been known to like drape necklaces over paintings and you know i like to look at my jewelry not just when i wear it so yeah i incorporate my jewelry into my art they're like little mini <laughs> sculptures or mini yeah yeah they're beautiful every piece don't hide it okay that was a good question oh, that was janet so, so thanks for that question oh, paul anyone I else paul i don't do any wall art like that but several of my paint several of my pieces have inspired people to put them in paintings so um Ooh. liana or if you remember liana that was at celebration she is uh, fresco Fresco artist, and she has a, a nude that she did with Penelope, and she I had made a, a an engagement ring for her, a wedding ring. I don't know, I don't remember exactly what it was, but she painted into uh, into the fresco, which is pretty cool. Absolutely. Well, and this the pieces behind you are art forms. The oh, they are. Yeah, yeah. Cool. How about you, Shelley? You know. I'm more of a draper like you, like just have the jewelry, you know, kind of everywhere hanging over the corners of my mirrors so I can see it, that type of thing. But I, I do want to note our, our friend and colleague, um, Elizabeth, has been making wall, metal wall art that mimics the look of her small jewelry items. It's, it's just really neat. And I, it made me think of her when that question. Yeah, Elizabeth Hake. Yeah, she's, she, in fact, we've added sculpture to her uh, art forms. And she's done some beautiful wall hanging pieces. So I, I, I just, art inspires art for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Do we have more questions or shall we move on to, um, Paul, you showed us a little bit of the, the materials that you use and you both have kind of alluded a little bit to, um, definitely with, with the silver and gold, you need to apply heat to manipulate the metal to 
to have it become what you want to come so what you want it to be so how how is it just torches or tell us a little bit about that we'll start with you Shelly well funny that you ask Woo! Do you see? Maybe a little. Uh, Paul's going to get his. I can see it with my So um, this is an oxygen and acetylene uh, torch kit. This one's throwing a bigger flame. This is actually what I do the actual reticulation process with. I don't know if you can see this, but I actually, you know, apply it right on the sheet of metal like this, and it'll actually wrinkle and do what I showed. I won't do it now, but. Um, anyway, so, and then I use a smaller tip that puts about a one inch flame out, and that's what I actually fuse the gold and the silver um, on with, and then I'll use solder. Solder is like, I mean, I know everybody knows this, but solder is like glue for metal. So solder actually is how I will adhere a setting. Like I, you know, I made this gold bezel and then I soldered it to the ring band. I don't know if you can see that. But anyway, so there's, yeah, there's a lot of heat and flame involved. And you said earlier, you, you do not do cast work, but if you did, that would in, involve making a mold and then putting Yeah, in. I've, I've never been, um, if I were a really good miniature sculptor, um, I, I think, you know, and that's why some of the, uh, like, Bryce and you know some people that are the good sculptors they can take their pieces and make a, a mold and and cast it um i'm more of a flat sheet metal twist turn fold that kind of that's what i like that's what i enjoy doing because for me i never really wanted to make more than one of the same so i don't really want a mold because i don't want another one i want you know i just want them all to be different completely different so, yeah, just how I feel about it. All right, Paul, did you go get, gather a tool? I knew it. I'll show you my torch. This is very unique. I started using this about a year and a half ago. So this is a blowpipe torch. It's just propane. And the cool thing is I blow into this and I do circular breathing while I'm doing the torch and I fuse all my work. I, I use a little bit of solder once in a while, but now most of my pieces are fused. And I'm just gonna show you how the torch works. So I won't be able to talk while I'm doing this. So this is a torch with no oxygen. This is from me. So I can get little tiny flames. I can get a big flame. And I, I use a big bushy flame in order to um, create a, an oxygen reduction so the piece doesn't tarnish while I'm making it um, and actually uh, reduce it. It's called a reducing flame. It just reduces the oxygen around, but I'm actually breathing me into the piece. It's really cool. I, I love doing it. It's just really fun. That is fascinating. And so good to focus on breathing. <laughs> Absolutely. There's a new book that a, a bunch of people I know are talking about called Breath. No, called Breathe. I don't, I don't know what it's called, but it's about breathing properly. So you could probably teach us that. But um, is, that a, is that tool like an antique tool or is it a current tool? Well, that's a good question. Okay, so this is an old, this is a German torch. It's still being made, but I mean, the one of the people that I've been doing some master's classes with, uh, he uses this torch, and that's when I first started using it a little over a year ago. Um, and it's made in Germany, and he learned on this type of torch 50 years ago. So it's been around a long time, but original, when they were doing granulation, and what's so cool about this is uh, when they were doing granulation and all these ancient pieces that you see in the in the Met and 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 the museums, they were making these on charcoal fire. So it would be charcoal with no flame, and it would be, and they put it on a little piece of charcoal, and they would use a blowpipe to blow across the piece, and that created the flame that would actually go and uh, fuse the gold together. And, and so it was all blowpipe and a, and a, and a coal 
uh, fire. That was it. That's how they did this. And it's just so amazing. Um, we have really unique tools, but it's kind of going backwards in a certain way. But I, I think it's just really cool. Well, uh, and <laughs> certainly jewelry has been around since, you know, ancient Egyptian times. So definitely without the technology of today, they were still able to, to create amazing works of, of, of art and jewelry. So, um, yeah, that's so cool. And uh, Diana, you showed us your needles and thread. You also use, um, you do a lot of cutting out of things. And uh, yeah. Nancy says she's got several of your woven metal bracelets and several pairs of earrings yeah. and she loves them all. Yay, Nancy. Hi, and I do Nancy. too. I, I will say, uh, I can take a collection of Diana's jewelry on a trip different colors, different styles, and they, they're all like really lightweight, and I have something to go with everything. Thank you. Yeah, my tools, I have uh, really good uh, pliers. Um, I use um, like t uh, texturing tools, like these are just purchased um, types of tools with different kinds of pointy ends and different things, but also there's wonderful like found objects for my surface design. So like this is a sea urchin that makes the most beautiful patterns when you roll it across the clay. Or like just even like you could go to the hardware store and find cool things like a screw, you know, or a piece of pipe with the screw threads on it. And um, so that's kind of fun just to do found objects for texture and so forth. Um, and then um, so my tools are simple. I do have to uh, bake the clay. So that's just a simple convection oven. So that's easy. Um, oh, wow. I, I do have like a butane torch that I occasionally might use to fuse something. It's a jump ring or whatever, but not as like you guys, like I'm not uh, pyromaniac. Torches. <laughs> <laughs> um, the pyros. Yeah. So Diane, and so the earrings you have on, um, those like if you flip it over they're a different color yeah is that from the layer of the polymer or well what i do um this so on the back you can see it's one set of colors so and fun on the front it's different and what i've done is to basically um laminate two different sheets of clay together so i plan out a palette and then i uh sheet the clay and then um I will laminate the two sheets together and then cut my shapes. And um, that's kind of how that gets. It's very sort of precision oriented, like you really want to have nice clean edges and all of that, but it's kind of a cool seamless look, so. And again, for those of you who've never experienced in-person Diana's, those might look like they weigh a lot, but they're, they're like a feather. Crazy light. You don't even know, yeah. you, don't even know yeah. you have them on. And the clay, and, uh, it's like the clay comes like, just to show you, it's like I use all different, Cernet, I use Fimo, I use Cato, um, Gulpy Souffle, each one has got um, I use Primo, translucent, and each one has different qualities and I blend a lot of my own colors. Um, so, but the clay kind of comes like this, it's kind of hard, and then you have to condition it to make it into a sort of malleable form. And my big tool acquisition this year was um, a $700 clay sheeter from Czechoslovakia designed by an engineering family that are just obsessed with solving all the problems of the traditional pasta machine that people use to sheet their clay. And it's like the best investment I ever made in my life. It has just been, I'm looking at it right now, in love with it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's called so the like it's, clay machine. It'd be like making pasta sheets, right? It is, is because in the past, well, normally people will just go buy a pasta machine and it has different settings for different thicknesses. And, you know, Nancy, you know, probably a little bit about that. And um, you just, roll your clay through to sheet it and blend it, but it also has a lot of negatives, like it gets really dirty in there 
and you have to clean it, but it's really hard to take apart clean. They can be noisy, um, etc. So this is quiet, it's precise, it allows me to do anything from, you know, I can condition a whole block of clay this wide or something really thin, you know, like this, this veneer here. So, yeah. So, so my cool. tools are non-traditional, probably. And, it, and then the shapes, are you just cutting those out? No, these are, well, like, for instance, if I want to do the half circle, I have a huge collection of, it's kind of neat, like, um, I collect, like, cookie cutters, like right? Fish. Like, you can get, like, I just got a set of cutters from the Netherlands that are hearts, you know, and it's like, so I just, um, in the half circle, I'll just cut a full circle, cut it in half. I also use my, um, another tool like that is really important for me is tissue blades. They're very, very sharp blades and they can either be rigid or flexible. And if you take a flexible blade, a lot of times I'll just cut my own sort of organic shapes. So, um, so it's a mix of cutters, just using the blade and sometimes just even like an organic edge that I might want to keep that came out of the sheeting process. So. Awesome. Oh, so we have a, uh, thanks for sharing your beautiful pieces of art and enjoyed the Zoom session. Yay. Thanks. Sush. Yay. Um, so we have the Celebration of Fine Art 2021 coming up. Um, I think we've got maybe a little sneak peek from couple of you of what maybe to expect, but um, Diana, you just revealed something very intriguing to me that you'll have some wall hanging pieces or, yeah. so what should we be watching for? What, what have you been creating while we've all been in hiding? Are you asking me or the others? <laughs> well, you, I okay. guess we kind of got a sneak peek from you. We know yeah, we're going to have some, <laughs> some, some decorative art along with the functional art. So, um, Paul, you, you showed us that magnificent piece you're working on. I assume that's a commission with the, the uh, mother of pearl. No, it, oh, with the, no, it's not mother of pearl. It's actually an abalone pearl. Abalone, yeah. It's a natural pearl. There is no, it's not man-made. You can't, they can't culture it. Um, they reject anything you put in there. So when they find them, they're very, very valuable. And uh, so it has all different colors to it. And what I did was I selected different stones that are it, colors that are in the pearl. So I have uh, like a like a purple and um, the blue green and a green tourmaline, like a mint seafoam green tourmaline. And then uh, you can't really see it with my picture with the camera, but I did the granulation. I did little wires going up, filigree with and it's like seaweed because abalones are you know like kelp and so forth so it's actually kind of um i mean it's it's an artwork in itself oh yeah so uh but it is an mission. uh i was encouraged by uh my mentor to um you know what during COVID times you know you don't have anything to do just take what you have and go for it and uh make something spectacular and um he he was really encouraging. He has a piece in the Smithsonian that um, he created during, you know, some rough times during a recession and he didn't have anything else to do. And he, he had workers and he had to lay them off, but he had gold and stones and just said, okay, I'm just going to create something that I just didn't have time to do before. So that's, that's really cool. So that, really that, that's wonderful. Like use, yeah. use the negative to create something creative and fa fantastic, you know, yeah. How about you, Shell? Shelly? Oh, so I guess what I've been doing, I have like maybe all of us, we have, we collect these stones because we love them. And we have way more than we use on a daily basis, for instance. And I think the most fun part of having a little extra time has been to really go through those and start using some stones that I don't normally don't normally use 
you know, um, some like amylide and just some things I wouldn't normally do. Uh, you know, opals have been kind of like my last year sort of new thing and, and, and also um, just doing things other than just framing the piece with either gold or silver. I've been really doing just, I've gotten, I, I don't want to say, I guess I've gotten good enough at the fusing that I can now go across the center and create just like stripes. Like there's a couple pieces on the celebration website now, um, you know, a, a simple ring and a cup. And it's just where I'm just fusing again, no solder like Paul does with a granul granulation only, only I do it with wire and I just use it right across. And if it creates a little bit of a blip or not a perfect straight line, that, that makes it even better. And then, so I, I guess I'm putting more texture on the surface on top of the reticulation as if that wasn't enough. So yeah, more plain. That's great. And the ring, the ring that you have on, tell me that stone again. Yeah. So this one is um, this one is amylite. So I, another very soft stone that, since it is very soft, I, I created a 14 karat gold bezel to come bezel. up around it and protect it. Um, it was a kind of a long piece. It was bordering on a little long for a ring, but that didn't stop me. And then I did kind of a crazy, you know, sometimes I like to do the crazy wavy edges that are really organic and the silver itself had a neat, neat texture to it. So I don't know, I just, I, again, this one, I sort of shaped it as I was making it. I, I, I put the stone in the bezel first and sometimes I will start with that and I'll just figure out what needs to, what needs to back it up, so. Perfect. Well, so I, I just, I'm gonna say, I think that in 2021, we're gonna see more amazing works of art from all of you and everyone in the, in the show because everyone has really dug deep down and had this creative time available to them. So um, I think we're in for a great show, a great uh, showcase of, of beautiful pieces. Are there any other questions? We got a gorgeous Shelly from Doug and Kathy Morrow here, yay. Um, any other questions from Facebook or our, our Zoom folks uh, as we are nearing the end of our time today? You're open to those. Um, we are just so grateful to have everybody join us. Yes? Gail would like you to bring the abalone piece to the show next year. <laughs> yeah, Paul, bring it. Send me a picture when it's done. My gosh. Um, yeah, I'll be I'll be bringing it. Hopefully, uh, you know that my that's my plan. So I'll have a gorgeous picture and all that stuff taken by then. And uh, I was supposed to have it finished up, but I. I, I was going to enter in this contest, but it's like, it's going to have to wait until next year because um, I had this other piece for someone's birthday that has to be finished. And I'm like, okay, that, that goes first. So anyway, but it'll get done and uh, yes, it'll be there. Fantastic. That's great. So, uh, well, I would like to thank each of our presenters so much, um, Shelly, Diana and Paul for your time and for sharing your insights and, and your creativity with all of us today. And um, we look forward to seeing and actually, you know, trying things on as we get into the, uh, back to being connected again. So, um, and again, thanks to everyone who's joined us here for your time and we appreciate you so much. And um, October 23rd is our next Zoom online art discovery. It will be um, all about uh, glass. So more fun to be had there. So we hope that you'll join us for that. And as always, you know, if you have any other questions, feel free to um, send them to us after the fact. And if you want to get connected with any of the artists, let us know. And um, I guess unless we have any other questions, I'm just going to say thank you all for, for being here. And until we see you next time, keep celebrating art. Bye.